Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies, and I want to thank you for joining me in my study, The History of Scotch Whiskey. In this video, we're going to be looking at um, the sort of fallout of uh, conflict and post-war uh, progress. Um, there is something called a war economy. There is effects of what we might think of as the um, military industrial complex, and I'll get more into that uh, later. Uh, while I am uh, going over my notes, I'm going to be enjoying a glass from uh, the Long Grow Red Malbec Cast Mature. This is aged 13 years. So every year, uh, Long Grow, which is owned by Springbank, uh, produces a red wine cast. They've done Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cap Franc, Pinot Noir. This is the Malbec. I reviewed this a while ago. In fact, all the whiskeys that I've been tasting in my videos, I have already reviewed. I'm going to put a link to uh, my review of this whiskey down um, below. But in the meantime, let's get into our, my notes. By the outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939, the British economy had been bolstered by increasing levels of rearmament and Scotch whiskey output helped to a significant degree by U.S. exports, had climbed to almost 38 million gallons in 1938. So, in the short term, when a country is spending money on armaments, on the war machine, there will be an economic boost within a country, right? Millions of dollars are being spent on armament, on um, tanks, guns, airplanes, whatever. And people are being employed. People are working to build these things. Companies shift to a war economy. Bases are being built and local communities are being built up around military bases and so forth. The problem is, is rather obvious, is that when that kind of spending is going on, you're essentially running up debt. A country is running up debt. And the outflow of such an economy you know, surrounding restaurants and businesses and people buying and shopping and so forth, you know, coming out from this, uh, will be short term because once the, the war is over, or if they should stop spending on um, the industrial military complex, on the war machine, then you have to pay bills. But if you keep a war going for 5, 10, 15 years and start running up um, the bill for the war machine, uh, uh, with trillions of dollars in debt, you're essentially, in the long run, dooming a country. So, we have seen already, and we see this in the Second World War, uh, there is a slight economic boost in terms of people being employed. However, after the war, not only do you have to pay for debts, but then you have people coming home who are going to need jobs. And so that's a problem as well. Anyway, let's get more into our notes. However, the onset of war soon led to an increase in duty, which caused prices to rise in the region. Great emphasis was placed on continuing export of Scotch whiskey to the USA to help pay for war-related materials being purchased there. Duty rose dramatically once more in 1940 and again in 1942. Meanwhile, the allocation of barley for whiskey making was initially reduced and then stopped altogether which meant that many distillers were forced to sell stock which they were unable to replenish, leading to serious imbalances in most inventories during the years. Following the end of the war in 1945, the vast majority of Scotch distilleries had no choice but to close during the war and all were silent from late 1942. Nationally, in 1945, the year that the war ended, 34 malt distilleries were once again in operation, and in a famous minute, Prime Minister Winston Churchill noted in April 1945 that, on no account reduce the barley for whiskey. This takes years to mature and is invaluable export and dollar producer. Having regard to all our difficulties about export, it would be most improvident not to preserve this characteristic British element of ascendancy. From May 1947, under the Labour government, barley was allocated to distillers on the understanding that the ratio of exports to home sales would be kept at 3 to 1, and in 1948, home releases were further restricted to 20% of 
of pre-war levels. It was not until 1953 that Churchill's conservative government finally lifted wartime controls on the understanding that the SWA would voluntarily impose controls. These were not lifted until 1959. So the idea is they shifted their economy to a more of a foreign economy. They wanted more foreign spending. And so um, there were local taxes because they didn't want their own people uh, consuming it at all or necessarily even having a, a drinking problem. Um, and they wanted more money coming from the outside rather than spending from uh, within the inside. But uh, with that, let's take a little whiff. There's a slight red tinge to it. Uh, so it's sort of an amber with a tinge of red. And on the nose, there's a little peatiness, but you get sort of a chocolate-covered cherry note. There is a sweet and savory note that I really, really like. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, say, of a barbecue sauce. It has some nice vanillas, caramels, hints of spice. But the dominant character is this chocolate-covered cherry and a little bit of barbecue sauce. Mm. Really, really, really nice. 1946 Scotch exports begin in earnest, led by Cuddy Sark, which had been introduced by Berry Brothers and Red in 1923, specifically with the American market in mind. During 1946, 5,881,000 gallons of whiskey were exported, with nearly half destined for the USA. 4.7 million gallons were allocated to the domestic market, which was half the pre-war consumption level. The growing post-war thirst for scotch led to the next period of boom for the whiskey industry, and with much of the scotch whiskey industry's focus on the USA, Northern American companies' pre-war interest in owning significant stakes in the scotch whiskey industry continued in the years immediately after the cessation of hostilities. Of course, there's always, you know, if you notice so much emphasis is put on the USA, right? So people have gone back home after the war, people are buying, uh, prohibition has ended, and so people are buying uh, whiskey in the USA. But you have to diversify an economy. This is going to lead to trouble later on. We're, gonna, we're going into a big boom uh, during this time period. But you have to diversify your economy. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. And so if you're dependent on one particular country, heavily dependent on one particular country for doing all your purchases, then if that country should change its spending for whatever reason, if relations should fall out so that tariffs are put in place, or anything should happen uh, so that uh, that source, your dominant source for, for money, should dry up, you're then going to have another bust. Just like with your own stocks and bonds and your own interests, you want to sort of uh, diversify your portfolio. So you want to do the same thing in uh, exports as well. But this is going to come back to bite them in the ass because they don't have a diversified uh, exporting. Most significantly, in April 1949, Shiva's Brothers, founded during 1801 in Aberdeen, was acquired for 85 thousand and seventy pounds by Robert Brown Limited, part of the U.S. distiller Seagram Company Limited. The firm had been purchased in 1936 by the Whiskey Broken Partnership of Robert D. Lundy and Stanley P. Morrison, with Lundy being principal shareholder by this time. James Jimmy Barclay was the prime mover in these acquisitions and ultimately became managing director of Chivas Brothers. So let's get into the palette. Mm. It's sweet. It's silky. This is bottled at 51.3% alcohol by volume. It has a big punch of flavor, but it doesn't have a lot of burn. But in the follow through, do feel a little bit of warmth. But it's real silky. It has a nice balance of uh, smoke. To sweetness it doesn't have the sort of intense briny sea ocean seaweed medicinal notes 
that you get from uh, Isla uh, peated whiskeys. And so if you like uh, some smoke and some chocolate, but you're not into that sort of medicinal uh, seaweed kind of notes that you get from Isla, then this is a real nice one for you. By the way, the reason why I'm going with these is just for my own enjoyment and not as a formal review. I've already reviewed these and provided more notes about the distillery in my formal uh, reviews, which I'll link down below. A year after Seagram bought Shiva's Brothers, James Barkley was again active on the company's behalf, this time purchasing a Speyside distillery. Strath Isla, then known as Milton and owned by W.M. Longmore and Company Limited, had been put into liquidation by Inland Revenue and was offered at public auction in Aberdeen, being bought by Barclay for £71,000. Even more wartime restrictions were finally lived in 1959. Projected export demand and a thirsty domestic public largely denied access to whiskey, it was not surprising that several native distillers chose to introduce additional capacity into the Scotch whiskey industry, usually to meet specific customer needs for new fillings. The alternative was to acquire stocks on the booking market, which could be expensive and was not reliable. In 1949, there was an even more significant event in the rehabilitation of the Scotch whiskey industry with the construction of a new distillery at Blackford in Perthshire, christened Tullibardeen, or Tullibardine. One thing you'll notice in a lot of my videos is I don't always pronounce things correctly, and people are always quick to uh, correct my pronunciation. So I try to look them up, but sometimes it's Tullibardine, sometimes it's Tullibardine, sometimes it's tomato, sometimes it's tomato. Let's get back into it. This operation was built to the design of William Dallum Ovens, who was later responsible for the creation of Jura, and Glenelecki Distilleries, and it was the first entirely new post-war Scotch distillery. Indeed, it was the first malt distillery to be constructed in Scotland during the 20th century. And let's take a wee sip. Mmm. Delicious. Following on Seagram's early acquisitions, fellow North American distiller, Harem Walker & Sons Scotland Limited, purchased Glencadam Distillery in Brecon during July 1954 for 83,400 pounds. The firm also bought Block Brothers Distillery along with subsidiary Taylor and Ferguson Limited owners of Scapa Distillery for more than 2 million in the same year, acquiring substantial whiskey stocks in the process. In 1955, Hiram Walker went on to add Pulteney Distillery in Wick to its portfolio, buying it from the Cumming family for £87,500. Later acquisitions included Ardbeg and Bow Blair distilleries. So we're looking at some post-war growth and it all sounds good. And on our next video, we're gonna see even continued growth. This growth will continue all the way through the 1970s and then a shift happens in the 1980s which was the last time that we had a major bust. I'm not making any predictions, but I am saying we're probably due for a bust. Things are looking really, really, really good. The economy's looking really, really, really good. Um, things are growing really, really, really well. Whiskey is growing around the world. New markets are opening up, uh, looking particularly in Asia, look at China and so forth. Uh, there is much more of a diversified economy in terms of purchasing. Uh, the internet is uh, one of the greatest ways of getting information out about whiskey. Distilleries are popping up, not just in Scotland, but all over uh, the United States. Bourbon, um, Japan looks like it's going to be making a uh, resurgence, hopefully a sort of a reformation. So there's a lot going on in the whiskey world in general. Um, and new distilleries are popping up now in Scotland. But... You know, you, well, one thing you can't do is get myopic and just look at what's going on now without considering other things that are currently going on which could, could then have a negative outcome. So the things we've seen thus far that have had a negative impact, um, we've had uh, grain shortages, barley shortages, we've had wars, we've had prohibition, um, we've had imbalance uh, in taxes and so forth. So other things, I think, in our own time period 
um, that could make some positive changes if the economy or if the purchasing uh, allowed in India could change. If they were to drop their taxes, India could be a bigger consumer than the United States. Right now, they have 150 um, percent uh, taxation uh, on imports. If that were to change, that would revolutionize things. I think China could be another big um, purchaser. I think they already are now, but even more so uh, as, as their economy changes and as they have more of a booming economy, right? Um, that could change things as well. But um, as uh, national debts uh, perhaps come due, other markets could see a little bit of a dip, uh, which would then have a negative impact as well. So all these things uh, going on. Something to keep in mind. Alrighty, um, if you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, would you like watching my videos? I would greatly appreciate it. If you would subscribe, give it a thumbs up. Share with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, cheers. Knowing a lot about wine means you're a sissy. Knowing a lot about vodka means you're a club douche. Knowing a lot about whiskey means you're a true American hero. People who drink whiskey are less likely to get Alzheimer's and more likely to get laid, statistically. So